Hello, everyone, and hi, Matthew Stern. Welcome to Theatre Art Life and the We Make Events Fireside Chat. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone who has uh, jumped on Webinar Jam to uh, join us tonight. Uh, before I introduce Matthew properly, um, you may have come across this session uh, via Theatre Art Life or you might have come via We Make Events. And uh, if you haven't been following what We Make Events do uh, over the Christmas or what they're doing over the Christmas period, the We Make Events UK, there's a whole bunch of things that they're doing on entertainment, support sessions, skills workshops, fireside chats like tonight and online forums. So make sure you head over to the website uh, and head into the calendar and join some sessions that are happening over the Christmas period uh, to keep us motivated given our various stages of lockdown around the world. Now I am here in Hong Kong and we are a little bit locked down as well. Uh, Matthew is of course in New York City uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction of his history but just before we do that um, you if you've not used Webinar Jam before you can always ask questions in the chat box on the right and we are both available to ask any uh, answer any questions that you may have uh, feel free to throw them at us and uh, we're going to talk about a lot of things uh, COVID we're going to talk about Broadway we're going to talk about virtual events we're going to talk about the Broadway stage management symposium lots of things um, so if you don't ask questions we're just going to chat anyway because <laughs> that's what Matthew I'm looking and I do. forward to both of it <laughs> <laughs> So Matthew, um, after earning a BA in theatre from the University of California in Sa at San Diego, uh, followed his dream of working on Broadway by moving to the bright lights of New York City. His work on Broadway includes Play On, Grease, The Full Monty, Enchanted April, The Oldest Living Confederate Widow Tells All, The Phantom of the Opera, Fiddler on the Roof, Wicked, The Little Mermaid, Baby It's You, An Evening with Patti Lapone and Mandy Patinkin, Death of a Salesman, Hands on a Hard Body, Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, Sideshow, Dr. Zhivago, On the Town and Finding Neverland. In addition to this long line of credits, Matthew spent three seasons on the Radio City Christmas Spectacular and has worked numerous corporate events around the world. Matthew's tours include Grease, Martha Graham Dance Company, Les Mis, Billy Crystal's 700 Sundays, Stories by Heart with John Lithgow, An Evening with Patti Lapone and Mandy Patinkin and Mandy Patinkin Dress Casual. And Matthew, in all of that work, still finds time to share and give back to the next generation of stage managers as he teaches at SUNY, is it pronounced SUNY? Yeah. Purchase Conservatory of it? Yeah. Yep. Purchase Conservative, Conservative of Design and Technology. He His work in the classroom, sharing his Broadway experience and having his students observe his productions has shown incredible benefits students receive with access to Broadway. And how I know him by combining his love of teaching and experience on Broadway, Matthew has created the Broadway Stage Management Symposium, which every year we jump together and talk all things stage management with a bunch of other uh, nerdy stage managers for an entire weekend, and it's an absolute blast. So, Matthew, thank you for joining us today. Ooh, thank you. Thanks for having me. That sounds like a lot when you put it all together like that. It's fantastic. It's good. I read the full thing. I was like, why, why, why go, why go uh, slow in in this one? So, so I wanted to start with, um, you know, maybe for those who are across the water in the UK and for me in Hong Kong, can you just give us a bit of rundown about the status of uh, Broadway, COVID, your work, uh, and the situation over there? Oh, okay. Just a little thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the big date here for us um, was March 12th, and that's when Broadway shut down. Uh, it ironically was actually the opening night of Six was supposed to premiere on Broadway that evening. And as they were in the preparations, word came down, performance was canceled, everyone grabbed their stuff and, and had to leave. And since then, Broadway has literally just been in the dark. So the entire community, the uh, the jewel in the in the crown, so to speak, of uh, our U.S. theater, um, just gone. Uh, there have been some regional productions. There have been a handful uh, that Actors Equity has approved um, when cases were lower over the over parts of the summer that were outdoors up in up in New England here. Um, there were other smaller like dinner theaters and stuff down in Florida who were not not union, not equity, who were trying to do their own thing. 
in some states where they were allowed to do some of that, uh, kind of against uh, medical advice. Um, and uh, the the producers uh, on Broadway have just basically kept kicking the can down. First it was, okay, maybe we'll be back uh, in the summer. Then it was, oh, maybe Labor Day. Um, okay, now we're looking at January. Now we're not looking at maybe coming back uh, in the summer. So it's um, it's been a real stretch. The community is very excited that we finally got some vaccines going. Uh, they just uh, started inoculating people here in New York yesterday. Wow. Um, yeah, um, which has been very exciting. But even those don't give you full immunity for at least six weeks. So you have your first shot, then your second shot. Um, and then the way most uh, most uh, uh, vaccine managers, I think that's the term they've been using, have been figuring out who's getting vaccinated. Regular old, you know, adult healthy people uh, like me, knock on wood, won't be getting it until uh, late spring mm -hmm. um, at the earliest. Um, so uh, realistically, we're not looking at coming back until maybe summer. Um, mm -hmm. but uh, at the earliest, uh, as I was telling uh, you earlier, Anna, uh, Hamilton is, as you'd expect, leading the charge. Um, that great, fabulous monolith, uh, huge mega hit that we all love, um, announcing that they're shooting for a July 4th uh, reopening, which is actually, if you don't know, that's our Independence Day. And with the topic of what Hamilton is about, um, it is not only a great uh, PR move, but it's also a great inspirational move. Mm. Well, I hope that the trajectory of that uh, continues along uh, as planned so that we can get uh, back to shows in, in the summer. Um, with, uh, with you personally, uh, obviously you've, you've probably had to go to some more online work. Is that, is that what you've been doing over the last few months? Yeah, I actually did, um, I, did a, a, I guess, a pre-pandemic pivot um, where I started uh, taking more uh, event work over the last few years uh, keeping my feet in Broadway, but uh, my, my balance kind of shifted a bit. And the event industry in my circles started coming back in like late summer. Uh, mm -hmm. And we started doing online events. So I would literally sit right here in this chair with my now three monitors up here and uh, be on calm with uh, friends and colleagues and call shows. So it's wow. been a really crazy experience. I compare it to it's like the Wild West because every workflow is different. Every show is reinventing the wheel in some fashion. And you just kind of hold on tight. Here's our run of show. Let's talk through it, what we're doing. I had one, ev I had one event um, that was a few days after I had a big storm come through and knock up my internet for a couple of days. So I was literally commuting to the city to the empty uh, event production company's offices and setting up there. <laughs> to actually call the virtual show. I'm like in this conference room with this big old screen up there. I'm like, there's nobody around. <laughs> the so weird. Yeah, and because every, it's everything's online and everything's re all totally reliant on the internet. And even on some, on some events that I've produced, you're like, okay, we can control what, what we're sending to people, but we can't control what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole type of experience. Even right now, like if my internet goes down, I will free. <laughs> yeah, totally. Just kidding. Um, I would, freeze, <laughs> but it has nothing to do with the internet that everyone is receiving per se. So it's this whole weird, you can only control the middle. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. So that when wild you... life has been crazy. <laughs> for those who sort of have stayed pretty traditionally in the theatrical realm, how easy was it for you to pivot into the event world um, as a stage manager? Um, the, my pivot was relatively seamless and it happened accidentally as sometimes these things do. Um, I was doing uh, the Fiddler on the Roof revival with Alfred Molina when a company wanted to rent out uh, the theater for an event and hire some of the actors to perform. And since I had to be there anyway to babysit our show, they said, hey, why don't you stage manage? I was like, okay, sure. And then I started working with that company for the next few years doing weird things like being a media manager for a online uh, construction workers management software, um, uh, stage managing for managing for the uh, trade show for uh, an educational publisher. So weird stuff that mm. I've never done before, but the exact same skill set. Mm. So just learning some new terms and some new workflows. Uh, at the same time, that was when the uh, RNC, the Republican National Convention, had their uh, convention here in New York. 
and they bought out a bunch of Broadway shows. So I met an event producer who was helping us coordinate that for Fiddler, where we had uh, a whole bunch of Republicans watching Fiddler on the Roof one night, a very <laughs> odd experience. Um, and then I started working with that producer on some other things. Uh, so it's kind of like one thing led to another. And there's a bit of a tradition of some Broadway stage managers going into events. For those of you who attended the Broadway Stage Management Symposium last year, we actually did a panel on that, on a series of, uh, I think it was six or seven different Broadway stage managers who pivoted into the event world. And it is the exact same skill set, but like I compare it to touring. You know, when mm. you want to get into it, everyone wants you to have experience, but no one wants to hire you without the experience. So how do you get the experience? <laughs> so you have to find ways of being being persistent, being creative, um, finding where in your network people are doing what you're doing, whether it's that one removed or two removed or three removed, um, to try to get your foot in the door. But as a theatrical stage manager going into events, your skill set is so valuable. And you have so many advantages to people who just come up just doing in the event world because they're not thinking theatrically. You know, mm. you, you were taking business meetings and making them into shows. Um, and if you want to see some of the great history of events, if you check out the documentary Bathtubs Over Broadway, it's a really hysterical look at the early days of events where they were doing Broadway shows, Broadway type shows, that style with ensembles and numbers and people like Sheldon Harnick are writing lyrics for for like, uh, you know, deodorant. Wow. So it's a really it's a really fun example of some of the stuff that was happening. Not as much entertainment happening now, but still it, it still sometimes happens. Um, mm. And your skill set is so valuable because you can make a, a business meeting of just talking heads a bit more theatrical and your col your ability to collaborate and to lead people. So, you know, theatrical stage managers, some of the, some of the most amazing people ever. And we we can ma help make the impossible possible. So it's a great skill set to have. Uh, and I think in the end, it, it's still a show, even though it might be a corporate conference or it might be, a you know, an event for people. I think I view events as still from start to end an audience experience. It may just go for an entire day instead of a two hour period of them sitting in a theater, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It goes back to that Aristotelian definition. You know, someone does something on stage and other people watch it. <laughs> the real, the basic exactly. definition of theater. You do something, I watch it. That's theater. And then all the, yeah. all the sound and music and lights and videos that go around it, that's the spectacle and that's what what ideally supports that message so whether it's you know mm. whether it's a great classic play whether you're doing death of a salesman with an incredible with all this depth and soul pouring out on stage or if you're doing a corporate meeting about oh my god we have this we have this new vaccine out and it's going to help save the world you know you're still you're telling a story mm. Mm. with you with you with what you're doing now um in sort of calling online events and and this this sort of model of execution for an event uh do you think moving back it'll be more of this hybrid model or do you think we'll go back to more of that live event once we're able to be free and easy without masks on and social distancing well i i think events and the, the business community as well as the theatrical community and people at large are really will want to get back together. I think mm. there's a thirst and, a, and a, a hunger. And actually, I think it was, was it something John Stamos said on the one night only uh, Tina Fey event a couple nights ago um, about like a, in, after the Spanish flu in the 1920s were a huge uh, time of almost like a, a renaissance and invigoration of a celebration. So much was happening uh, culturally. Um, mm. that I, I think we could see something like that. I hope we would see something like that. However, what we've learned, we're never actually going back. Mm. I, I, I think the stuff we're doing now, this type of webinar, the bazillion Zoom meetings everyone has every day, that's going to be part of our toolkit and it's not going anywhere. I, mm. I, I, I could see people are bringing that into not just events and meetings, which was sort of a little add-on. It was like, okay, we're doing our show, and then, oh yeah, don't forget about the live stream. It's like, no, the live stream is going to be just as important, if not more so. <laughs> you know, I'm imagining a vision w where um, you have two show callers. For
for every event because somebody has to call the live and somebody has to call the online. So, mm. so let's, let's hope there's twice as much work for stage managers going forward. Exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. Even in in the theatrical realm, you know, I was postulating months ago. I wrote a blog that kind of made the rounds a bit early in COVID about you know ten things that I think stage managers and people need to think about regarding COVID. And these type of Zoom Zoom meetings, webinars, that's going to be part of our process. I don't see how we how we get away from that. You know, there was an article I think isn't that in the Times a couple of days ago um, about. Um, our process going forward and what, what's, what's theater going to look like. And we're, we're going to have artists don't always have to live in New York city or in London. You can live farther out. You don't have to commute in for every single meeting. You know, the mm. first day meet and greets that, that we're all used to doing. It's like the whole company is not getting together. No, you set up, you set up a big screen and there's 49 little boxes on the screen. And then some of the company is live, the people that have to be there, but why? Why everyone's everyone's used to seeing everyone in two dimensions in a, in, in a little rectangle or a square. Mm. That's that that's the new normal. So we're it, it's going to be different, but hopefully there will be a lot more connection and a hunger for the connection. Even though you can have the ability to be in New York for a one p.m. meeting and be in L.A. for a three p.m. meeting, and then okay, yeah, we're going to have that meeting in Hong Kong at uh, at nine a.m., <laughs> yeah. which you would never be able to do. But now you can. Yeah. Later, you can literally be in two places at the same time. I actually did that a couple of months ago. I was supervising one event on this computer and I was running an event on this computer. <laughs> it's like, I, 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 I can literally, I'm actually, I'm finally able to be in two places at once. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. But I also think it's, you know, like you're right, that the, the first question a stage manager might ask is, is it necessary to be in person for this particular meeting or this particular moment? And I know that, especially in Asia, where we're very, we do, you know, Hong Kong is such a small place. And a lot of the times you will go to a location for some meetings or you literally fly to another country for potentially a meeting. And I think now that will be, we'll be really reevaluating the cost and good, thankfully, because it's probably a much greener thing to do to say, mm -hmm. okay, we can establish that this part of the production can stay online. And then when we really, really have to get over there, we get over there and deliver. I just spoke to a director in the States who literally uh, directed Phantom of the Opera in Japan via Zoom over the last few months because he couldn't get there. Um, and he was telling me about the uh, the process, which was not, again, still not an ideal um, format, but they managed uh, the, 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 the actors would come away and do some notes one-on-one -on, -one on the Zoom and then he'd go and watch the big ensemble and yeah, and it, they made it happen, you know, the, the things people will do to get back on stage, but they, they did it. Yeah. I, I, I saw pictures of that, you know, floating through the internet and, uh, it's really amazing what you can do. It's not what we yeah. want to do, but you can, you can do these things. You can have design meetings, you know, on a computer, you know, we, we've learned that we've, we've done it when we had to do it. And now it's just another tool in our toolkit, you know? And mm. so that's, this is yeah, well, I, I was, I was going to just expand because from the Broadway angle, we've learned all about, you know, we, other avenues, but with Hamilton, again, leading the charge with the releasing on Disney plus, but Diana, the musical did a recording that'll be coming out on Netflix, uh, early in the next year. Um, all the new versions of, of, uh, re-envisioned plays, whether it's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom just came out, what the Constitution means to me. There's so many new avenues to present now um, with all the various pivots, either on the streaming services or on the internet, that uh, the theater is, is having to reinvent itself in, in new ways as well. Mm. And I think, you know, I, I don't know what your opinion was. Historically, I think people, um, had a feeling that a digital capture um, was not the same thing or not as of value than a live show, which of course it is not. But now I feel like with the advent of Hamilton coming out on Disney Plus, that's exposed uh, that musical to a big, 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 large audience that would be probably, I don't know, in, in, in the people that I've spoken to, far more inclined to go and see it when it comes out close to them because of it being available on Disney+. Plus. And that's really kind of reversed our idea of what online capture or capturing it for, for a digital um, 
you know, as, uh, viewing uh, as well as alive. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, look at the history over the last decade when cinematic releases of Broadway musicals, whether it was Chicago or Rent, um, it did more to um, more for the show than become a substitute for the show. People came mm -hmm. out of that experience going, oh, I like that. I would like to see it. So I, I, I think that we've learned that our assumption that if people can get it somewhere else, they will be less inclined isn't true. Uh, mm. it, it's just not. People want the live experience. If they go and see it and like it, they will want to see it. They will want to see the original. They will want to see the live version. And so it does increase the exposure. I think the big challenge is how it will go, the difference between Hamilton versus Diana, something that's known and is a hit versus something that's unknown and people don't already have a relationship to. Mm. So I'm really curious as to how that is received and if Diana is embraced even close to the way Hamilton was received, that 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 will be the real revolution where now it's like, okay, now we know that that financial model is successful. We think mm. it is. Hamilton has shown it is, but Hamilton is, you know, the outlier. Um, can can regular shows who don't have a hit Broadway opening and don't already have a following, can they be successful in a streaming model? And 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 so we'll see. And then you can debate the live capture version versus the reimaginings, um, like Maureen's Black Bottom or the In the Heights film that's coming out. West Side Story, Tick, Tick, Boom. I mean, these titles, you're just like, oh my God. And these are all just in the last year where mm. all these titles are now being coming back to the big screen. It's almost like, you know, it's almost like another golden age instead of coming out with, you know, Sound of Music and Oklahoma and South Pacific, you're getting all these other ones coming out in, in theatrical releases. Mm. I think one of the most, uh, interesting part of the Hamilton version online was its intimacy in its uh, shooting from its from a from a cinematography point of view but also the element that you really felt that you were in the audience because there's you there was audience laughter and response and interactivity I'm I'm guessing that given Diana is being filmed in this period that they would not have an audience uh, so I wonder if they're going to put reactions in there to make it sound like it there or not and what would that that you know because I, I really just feel like that's so much part of Hamilton's narrative in that in that mm -hmm. film version of it so what are your thoughts on that yeah Diana filmed without an audience so you're correct they did their thing they all went into a bubble the whole company cast and crew for two weeks they did their quarantine and they literally went from the hotel to the theater and that's it during their shoot um I don't know if they're putting in audience responses and reactions, but much like the football is doing, the football, much like the NFL is doing, um, I think it would <laughs> them uh, to do that. You know, I mean, sitcoms have been doing it for years and it makes them, mm. makes them better. I mean, all those, all those, uh, you know, preteen Disney sitcoms that my, my 10 year old seems to love with all the canned laughter that drive me nuts, but it works. Yeah. <laughs> it works. It tells you that was funny. You should laugh at that. that <laughs> So it'll be interesting to see how they wind up putting that together. Um, but the, both Hamilton and Diana filmed over a series of days. So they mm -hmm. were able to get a large amount of different camera shots. They were able to get on stage with the action and really put you in the middle of it. Unlike, you know, the archival shots that you usually do for Lincoln Center, which even mm -hmm. though they're doing multiple camera shoots, they're still hiding in the back or up in the, in the box seats. They don't get that intimacy that you, experience with the Hamilton live capture. So by doing it mm -hmm. over a period of a few days, you're able to get that, do that type of work. And then the plan is I'm guessing that when Diana can come to a live show, they'll come to a live show, okay. right? So. Absolutely, God yeah. willing, knock on wood, because uh, it, it's hard. The economic model is very difficult. And even though you've seen some parts of our country try to figure out how do we, op how do we, op how do we reopen with COVID compliance and figure out the distance and the temperature checks and the spacing, the, the production they did up at the Berkshires with Godspell, you know, every actor had their little zone and they stayed in their little zone. This is like during the performance. Then they came out mm. and sang the song and went back to the little zone and it worked. People loved it. It was extended. It was well-received. It was, it was outside in a tent, but with the Broadway model, the economics around it are so difficult that 
being able to actually perform a show where the audience has to be social distance. And so you've cut your capacity, not just in half, but maybe to a third mm. just, just doesn't work. So we've seen, at least in the commercial theater on, on Broadway, instead of trying to figure out how to make it COVID compliant, it's how do we even make it economically viable? And that's why it's just been kick the can down. No, but we kick, kick the can down the road. Kick can. So now it's like summer, fall, because until we have our you know herd immunity in place, you can't e even without the tourism, even if it's just New Yorkers, you can't mm -hmm. you, a, a thousand seat theater you, with three hundred people in it, even if they're paying full price, isn't isn't going to pay all the bills. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, that's the the business side of it. Brian asks Matt, your SM Tech Fridays, and before before you answer this question, you might want to explain for those who don't know what SM Tech Fridays is, have been very valuable in better understanding the streaming world. Do you think? these they do you feel these will be important skills for the sm to have in the future or will those responsibilities might more likely transition back to technicians and operators sure oh thanks brian for, for bringing that up i appreciate it um i'm glad you're enjoying the tech fridays um as part of the broadway stage management symposium which in brief uh as anna mentioned earlier is an annual stage management conference that we've been doing in new york for the last six years Last year, we, like everybody, had to pivot to going totally online, which is a huge success. We loved being able to be, be you know, welcome everyone around the world, which was great. Um, but in, uh, in preparation for that, once our shutdown happened in March, uh, we started offering weekly Friday free webinars about technology for stage managers. Because the one, the one, the silver lining that I see in all this is the gift of time. Like, granted, there are huge economic costs, there are huge health costs but there's, there's time. So as stage managers, we rarely have the opportunity to learn and new skills and new technologies because we're so busy doing, right? We ha you, you, nobody wants to wait for the stage manager. You're never in tech and you go, wait, no, hold on a second. Stage management needs some time. You're like, what? People's heads are gonna explode. You're like, no, you can <laughs> hold the sound, you can hold for lights, you can hold for singing, but holding for stage management? <laughs> no, don't do that. Um, but now we have to get the time. So let's evaluate our processes. What can be better? What can be more efficient? And in the same way, there's lots of other things that we can be doing better, but I'll get, that's a, I'll, that's a, a, a sidebar I'll get to. It's not a sidebar. It's parallel to that and I'll get to it. Um, so we've been exploring new technologies, which has been great, whether it's been stage right or show builder or Theatron out in Finland, uh, call Q out in the UK. There's been, there's so much going on for us to uh, line it. There's so many people who are inventing things for to help stage managers. So heck, let's do it. It's always been a part of the symposium's mission, but now we're kind of blowing that up and being like, hey, let's look at all these new things. So we've literally done 34, 33 of them so far. That's all wow. hosted on the website. Thank you, uh, uh, Bill, for putting it up, the link up there in the chat. Um, and I, I do think it's gonna be important. I mean, in general, the more you know, the more you know. Stage management traditionally is a trade, as uh, a jack of all trades kind of profession. So you wanna know as much about everything as you can. And I think the huge benefit of some of these technologies is it's gonna make your life easier. It's gonna make your workflow simpler. It's gonna save you time. It's gonna help you with your work-life balance. It's a bet there are better communication tools out there. The challenge is it takes time to learn them. So take the time when you have them. For example, we've done a couple sessions on FileMaker Pro. A great database tool can do some amazing things, but it's not easy to learn. It really is a blank slate. And you're like, okay, now what do I do? And <laughs> I remember years ago, Thomas Rechtenwald, dear friend, he was a PA for me with me on uh, The Little Mermaid. And now he's gone on to be a Broadway stage manager, highly sought after, doing Pretty Women and uh, uh, On Your Feet, all kinds of great stuff. Well, I remember him posting on his Instagram a couple of years ago. Yeah, on vacation in the Bahamas, sitting on the beach, work, working on teaching myself FileMaker. You know, he literally took two weeks sitting on a beach to learn it. Like, great, you had the time to sit on a beach and doing it. How awesome. Um, that's <laughs> much, it's a much more ideal scenario. But if you have to be stuck at home, if you have to not be working, you can use that, use that time to grow your skill set. And I think some of them might be more valuable than others, certainly, but the more you know about all of it, the better prepared you are to deal with everything. You just add to your skill set, add to your skill set. 
Um, and this was the pivot I was going to make in the same way that we're trying to build, you know, I steal it from Joe Biden, build back our theaters better, right? Regarding social justice and equity and inclusion, like we really have to look at all of our processes and take this opportunity to, to self-reflect. I mean, it's really an opportunity we have to be like, what have we been doing? What have we been just accepting? Cause that, that's the way it's been done. And what can we do better? And if, if we can really do that, then we will have used this time to our best advantage. And it's not wasted time. Um, I, as you mentioned, I teach at SUNY Purchase. I was talking with a student who's thinking about taking a gap year, taking some time off. I'm like, that's great. Whatever you're going to do, use that time. There's lots of things you can do. God bless that this happened. In, if this pandemic had to happen in an age where we have the internet and can stay connected, because even though we have to be distant, we don't have to be disconnected. Mm. There's lots of different things that we can engage in, whether it's the symposiums, uh, SM Tech Fridays, and the symposium that'll be coming up in, at the end of May, 21 through 24. I'll get more to that later. Um, whether it's the, S, the SMA, uh, the Stage Manager Association is, has a lot of great programming. You're the stage manager, has a lot of great programming. Anna, you're doing so many great things with uh, Theater Art Life. You know, I'm always seeing like, and there's an, oh my God, there's another thing. Oh, I want to check that out. There's so many <laughs> things going on um, that you you, re you really can get a huge education. And it takes mm. a little bit of effort because you're not like sitting watching TV and getting commercials for it. You have to go out and you have to, you have to seek it out a bit. Um, and this is the same, the same advice I give young stage managers. You, you have to, you have to engage and it's harder now. It's harder because we're all in some ways battling some level of depression or anxiety, anxiety. There's so much of that going on, but if you can just get out there a bit and engage and find one thing to do each day, that's great. That's one, that's one positive step. You know, mm. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Isn't that, isn't that a thing? Absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I think that's always, the, you know, it's such a good point, Matthew, because we can't do everything. And, 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 I, and I, have a, I have had a lot of empathy when this first started for those people who may have just been graduating out of um, university to come into the, the market and then to be given a year and a half of nothing. You know, this is your time to take some strides and meet some people and PA somewhere or assistant stage manage. Um, and a couple of people have already asked on the, on the chat about, you know, what would be the first steps to become, to take to become a stage manager and enter the industry. Um, I guess what you're saying is start small with those aspects in terms of, you know, getting involved in sessions and all of that. What about in networking in, in this sort of period of time? It, it, what, what do you think is the best way for those who are young trying to get into the industry? You know, there's no way you can necessarily showcase your work, right? So what is the best, what's, a, what's an option for them? Well, it's always been about people connections. Uh, you know, it, it sounds harsh, I think, when you say that it's about who you know. But I think once you accept in a certain way mm -hmm. that it is about who you know, it's in a way liberating. So it's like, okay, now I know. Stage management and the theater in general is we're, we're, we work in such an emotional place that it's more important to most people that you work with people that you know, trust, like, love, right, want to be around than it is that they have a certain skill set. So I really think it's less about showing that you can make a prop list or you can call a big show or you know how to deal with harnesses and flying than it is that we can sit down and engage and have a conversation and get along and I like hanging out with you. Um, so how do you do that in this day and age, right? Well, it, it takes more effort. It's not as easy as just knocking on the stage door of a theater and going, hey, is the stage manager around? Can I, can I talk with him? Can I take a look? Um, can I drop off a resume? Um, you, you have to find ways to dig a little deeper and find those connections, those places like LinkedIn, Facebook, even even the Instagram, right? Where who do you know knows someone else? And you'll be surprised, even in just your family and friends unit, you'd be surprised who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone. And that's that's part of that research that you have to do into your network to find out where your connections are. And then find a way to make them professionally, nicely. You know, you send that that nice email, which is the, the cover letter, you can attach a resume. And um 
and you let it be. And most people, when they dig to their email inbox, will eventually get back to you because most people are generally kind and nice, and especially in the theater. Like I said, I think stage managed, theatrical stage managers are some of the best people ever. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> we do, we, we have a, a, a heart that, that allows us to do so much for other people that we get value out of that. And so we want to help make connections. And mentorship is so much of what happens because everything in stage management is ephemeral. You know, the paperwork, yeah, you can, uh, like paperwork can be paperwork, but what you really do is communicate. What you really do is lead. So how you interact with people and we stage managers want to help. We want to pass down. That's why the all the speakers who come to the Broadway Stage Management Sympo Symposium every year love sharing, love participating, because we've all been mentored in some fashion by others, and everyone wants to pay it forward. Everyone wants to share because we love what we do, and we love people. Um, I think I took a little bit of a left turn there, but uh, it, it, it does come back to trying to find ways to engage. I've got a couple meetings coming up with people who have found me who've been like, hey, can you can I bend your ear? Can I chat? When, when does that work? And I'm like, all right, well, have this day, this time, and we'll have a little chat. And it, you never know what'll happen when someone has a job opportunity and you're top of mind at that moment, like, oh, hey, I just spoke with this person. How about that? Or when when this is all, you know, it's been a couple months or it's been a year and, you know, I see your resume comes through another source. So like, oh, wait, I remember talking to that person. Yeah, that was really cool. All right, put them in the, in the you know, let's interview pile. Because so much of it is about it comes down to who you know, and it can be, it can feel challenging. And I'm going to build off this off Marlene's second part of her question, you know, is, uh, is a master's program relevant? Because it can be, that can be, that can definitely be a help and a boost to your career. I think about MFA and higher education programs and kind of, there's two really good reasons to do it. One, you come to stage management later in, in, in your undergrad. You're like, oh my gosh, I've been studying engineering. I found stage management. I love it, but I'm in my third year. I have one year of undergrad left and I don't know what to do next. I know I need to learn more, but I don't know. I, I don't know where to find that. So great. So go to an MFA program. You have a little bit of a basis. You're passionate about it. You'll get to learn a lot more in a very intense way and continue with your degree. And that's fabulous. That's an excellent use of that. Two, you've, you've gotten out of undergrad. You're starting to make your way, but you're just not finding the, your community. Your, your network isn't isn't building in the way you want. Your career isn't progressing the way you want. Going back to an MFA program can connect you with like-minded people to work in an intense way for two or three years. And you will all charge into the workforce together being very well-trained and already knowing that you love and working together. And so it it will propel you into like another community, which is which is great. And of course, you know, three, if you know you want to teach, then getting an MFA and getting it done sooner is better than later. Mm. But, uh, so I think it, it can be great, but it's certainly not necessary. Like no one's going to hire you for a stage management job based on the fact if you do or do not have an MFA. They won't necessarily do that if you have a BA or a BFA. You know, do you know what stage management is? Do you have, do you have a certain base level of skills? Okay, great. The other stuff I can teach you. I could teach you how I want paperwork done. I could teach you how to call a show if, if, if you have some sense of rhythm. But I can't teach you how to interact with people. I can't teach you how to be calm in a crisis. I can't teach you how to be diplomatic. Um, I can't teach you how to, how to you know, have a really nice dinner and hang out you know, at, at the table with John Lithgow. You know, it's, you just, <laughs> those are the kind of things you kind of you know, need to be part of you. And we need to connect. And if you connect in that way, those connections are what propel you. And every good job you do will lead to two more. You just don't know when. Hmm. I, I think to, to add to that, just because it happened to me particularly recently, is that I'm super busy and uh, a, a guy had come back from named Raphael and what, he might even be watching, I don't know. Uh, he, uh, he graduated from university in Chicago uh, in stage management and he came back to Hong Kong because his parents are here. And so he reached out to me. I met him for coffee and uh, we had a great chat, talked for about an hour and it was really nice. And I said, keep in touch, you know. And 
then you go about my way and I meet a lot of people and I engage a lot of people on LinkedIn and whatever. And, and I forgot, but to his credit, every once in a month, he just dropped me an email. How are you going? What's going on? You know, anything, anything happening in your world, just really casual. And it, about three or four months later, it dropped in at the moment that I'd just taken a gig where I needed some support. He came on as an intern. He did an absolute amazing job and he could be certain that I am not going to forget him and he's going to be my like left-hand man whenever I need somebody in Hong Kong right now. So um, it was his persistence and regular um, uh, touching base that made, reminded me and kept it there. And I think there's a feeling, a tendency to feel that you might be nagging or over the top or communicating too much. But trust me, when you're in the industry, you're usually so busy that I'd rather have you drop me an email every month and remind me that you're there but then because otherwise it, it will drop out of my head and it doesn't happen, you know what I mean? So I think it's really, I would encourage it to, you know, like Matthew says, communicate, communicate and communicate and keep in touch with people that you feel that you've connected with. Of course, you wouldn't do that for everybody that you've you've met. But if you felt like you had a gel and that would possibly be a good working relationship, make sure you maintain that communication regularly. So they're always your you become in the back of their mind when something pops up. Yeah, I would definitely do a yes and to that because it is possible to over communicate in that regards. And I'm glad that you, you get that. Like, it depends on the relationship. Mm. If you've developed a certain relationship where that type of a schedule and check in is good, and we all have those relationships in our lives, that's wonderful. But if it's a cold call, if it's, just, you know, it is possible to be too much, too enthusiastic and too communicative, where it's like, you're flooding my eight, my inbox. I got it. I know who you are. Please stop. I mean, <laughs> that is possible. And I, I would kind of just as a corollary, it is better to be forgotten than to be remembered in a negative way. So it that's just about that's just about the balance of being able to read through read the tone through the email. It's like, all right, would this be someone I would contact in a month, or does this be someone I would contact in six months? And mm. to make 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 sure you find that balance and be able to read between the lines, because uh, I I know I've got probably 180 something emails sitting screaming at me for attention and to get another one and another one and another one it it can get to be too much absolutely absolutely so moving on to coming out of uh the period that we are now what do you think i know you wrote the article um, very early on. So I was like, I was well impressed when you wrote that article because I'm like, damn, you're already thinking about coming back and we just dived into this. Um, we, thought we, I, we, we thought we'd be done a, a month or so. <laughs> <laughs> a year plus. And um, I think even, you know, looking back over um, what you wrote just recently, I feel like it's it's still quite relevant. I think people have come to, I'm not sure about in your part of the world, but come to some conclusions on how to work with this virus um, in, in a, you know, how do we keep ourselves socially distant? How do we maintain our backstage areas? What practices can put in place? And having prepared an event here um, that actually didn't go ahead, but it was going to go ahead um, across a number of venues here, it became very clear, okay, it's just another pillar of my organisation as, as, as producing this show. Okay, you always got to organise, you know, the staging and the lighting and the this and this and this. And now we have the COVID factor, right? And so it just becomes another pillar of um, organisation and facilitation that you have to think about and do. Uh, and what what are your thoughts, Matthew, in terms of how we as stage managers might be working coming back um, either in event realm or Broadway from when you first wrote that article. Yeah. Well, one of the biggest things I, I put in there was you needed someone who was not the stage manager to be in charge of all the, the COVID stuff. And we've seen the invention of this COVID compliance officer. And I really hope that that stays. I, my, my fear at the moment is that because there's a vaccine, that we're like, oh, we're all vaccinated. It's fine. We don't need to think about that anymore. Um, so I hope that we would continue to see that position be part of our team. And in a way, let's increase the stage management staff, right? Because stage managers have the ideal skill set with a little extra training 
I know I, I know there are Broadway stage managers, I can name a few off the top of my head, who are working as COVID compliance officers, whether it's been for theatrical work or cinematic work or event work. Um, and it's in a very important role. And I don't want that to be on stage management. You know, our, we've already been working thin pre, pre-COVID, pre-pandemic. So to add all those health and safety concerns on top of what we're already doing, um, I don't think is the best way to work. And I think we all need to be advocating for, all right, who's the COVID compliance officer on the show? Who's going to be dealing with that realm? Because that's going to be important because especially in the short term, like when we come back, because everybody's not going to be vaccinated. We still don't know if the vaccine keeps you from spreading the disease, even if it may keep you safe from getting sick. Um, so that that would be the single biggest thing that I would hope. Um, I, I, I'm weary because here, uh, especially in the US of A, we, uh, we have a penchant for, you know, my freedom, I can do whatever the hell I want and screw everybody else. Um, and it really is a communal effort. And we have to approach it as a community. The, the sincere lack of federal leadership has really hampered our ability in this country to limit the damage and the spread and the tragedy of, of this disease. So I hope that um, our community can have some stronger leadership as we come back and not try to cut every corner and to really be, to really understand that we do need COVID compliance, even though we are able to come back, this is not a magic pill. We're not all done. We do need to continue uh, until well into the next year or two to make sure that this this we really are done with this or is COVID just something we're going to live with like the flu and if that is if it is just going to be this kind of annual thing and it's going to be there was um certain just like very subtle processes around the city that I noticed were from in terms of cleanliness and also there was this tendency for anyone who gets sick in in Asia to put on a mask so that they don't spread the their flu etc and 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 so when COVID came, you know, Hong Kong was like, all right, put the mask on back into it, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we've, we've had a, although we're a very small city in terms of globally, um, they take it quite seriously. And I think hopefully my hope is that even when we move beyond that and we're, we're vaccinated and we're herd immunity and everything, that those similar, simple practices, um, stay and especially maybe in our backstage environments and certain, uh, sanitary factors that are included into our processes of cleaning and you know hand sanitizer and 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 how often we clean things to make sure that 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 doesn't spread because it, it's not to say that it doesn't happen again with another strain of virus in the future that we're not in, immune to right so let's let's keep ourselves in order <laughs> and in check right so that we don't yeah I, I i hope i hope i'm I, i'm concerned for us here with our great penchant for individual freedoms that uh, it becomes very easy to slide back and not spend the extra time or money involved in that kind of systemic change. Mm. I mean, I mean, there are systemic changes that need to happen, um, whether it is social justice issues or health and safety. And but it takes it takes time and money. And I'm really hoping that people that that our industry, our country can make that investment. Mm. Uh, it's very important on many levels. Um, you know, look at the, the Asian countries that have been weathered things very well, you know, whether it's South Korea, uh, Vietnam, there have been a lot of countries in other parts of the world who the whole country has done better than any state here in the U.S. Mm. And and that and, and, and that's because there's a there's a different philosophical basis for how that community functions. And I think for all the great benefits of the opportunities that that this American system of, you know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and individual freedoms and, and capitalism, there are some real pitfalls. And this has revealed a lot of the pitfalls um, in, in our society from you know social justice and race and, and issues, um, economic issues, but also health and safety. We, we have to, there are some things you just have to work on together. Mm. Um, and fortunately, I think our theatrical community tends to lean a certain way where where we get it, we are we are very supportive, and we we do we're used to work. We're used to collaborating, right? That's what we do. Our art form is about collaboration. Um, so I I think that our there's a lot of uh, desire to do that. 
I just hope the economic challenges um, that our theaters are based in, you know, we don't have the economic support like a UK or or, or other European countries for the arts. Hopefully that will change. There has been some discussions over maybe a cabinet, a cabinet level position for arts and culture. So let's hope that, that can, we can start to recognize the value of of arts in our society, that it is that it is essential and necessary um, and treat it as such. And then we can all work, know that we all have to be good together. Like you say, if someone in Hong Kong was sick, they would put on a mask. That's not really, you know, especially stage managers, I'm sick, well, I can still do my job, so I should go in and do my job, you know? So there, there are some systemic changes and attitudes we need to shift, like, oh, I'm not feeling so hot, I shouldn't go into work. That's the best thing I can do for my show. The best thing mm -hmm. I can do for my company is not go to work. And, and that's a big shift, both culturally and also I think for stage managers, because we, we have a little bit of a martyrdom complex, you know? I can go in, I can make it through, I've certainly, struggled through shows where I probably should have just stayed home, curled up in bed, and <laughs> hydrated. But you don't because you feel like it's your job to buck up and get in there and do it. I remember uh, doing the half hour call at the House of Dancing Water, eight months pregnant, lying down for 20 minutes for a nap and then getting up to call the show. I was like, you know, you should probably take that maternity leave now, Anna. Like, don't, don't try and man up and do that. It's too much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we have, a, have an overdeveloped sense of responsibility and with the good and the bad that comes with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Lizanne has an, a random question that I'm going to ask you. What kind of headset are you wearing? Oh, okay. Uh, this is the pro. Let me get you my, I think. It's the pro audio. Point source audio. All right. Their headset. It's the CMI5, I think it is. Um, uh, Point Source Audio is a great company. They're based in California, and they make these really amazing headsets that wrap around the back. So you so you can have things like your glasses aren't getting pinched, your head's not getting, you know, in a vice. You can wear a hard hat. Um, I I love it, and I'm thrilled with it. If you want, if if you go to the SM Tech Friday website earlier in this chat, we did a whole Tech Friday with Point Source Audio. They're a, a partner with the symposium, and uh, they talk all about it and the benefits. Um, and so it's really kind of cool. Oh, there it is. Thanks, Dylan. <laughs> and the CMI5. You, 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 you gang, you're quick. Oh, um, they are. They're, they're good. They're, they're good, our team. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I love it a lot. And it's been very comfortable. And uh, it has. It's attachment. Sorry. <laughs> so I, uh, I can plug it right into the computer because I, I, did, I did get this during the pandemic. And I was like, well, what kind of connection do you want? It's like, I need my computer connection. <laughs> first nice. and, then it, and then it comes with an adapter and i love this lovely orange box it's really kind of colorful and then i can have my adapter and i've actually used it on site for a couple a couple gigs so i can wear my hats because as a ball as a bald person it's a great temperature control you know you, you get you get too warm you take your hat off you get too cool you put your hat on and you're good there you go <laughs> Oh, well, we're almost hit an hour, Matthew, so thank you so much. I do want to sort of end on a, I mean, actually, I think you've been absolutely amazingly positive throughout our a whole hour of conversation, so I appreciate that, um, especially because it's such a hard time for a lot of people, and we have to acknowledge that even though we might be in a situation where we can afford to pay the bills and um, uh, take care of our kids to a certain extent, although still on a budget, but uh, it's... Uh, it's, it's a hard time for a lot of people and um, even motivating to get, you know, learn or work can be can be a struggle from day to day. Um, any what would you say sort of really for, for us as a community globally in the arts uh, in, in how, you know, what should we do for the next six months as we wait for things to come back online? Uh, well, the first thing I'd say is just breathe. It's hard. There, I've been in a lot of conversations about our own mental health, and it takes a toll. Um, I, I thank you for acknowledging the positivity. I, I, I work hard on trying to be optimistic, and part of who I am is I'm generally a, full of a lot of positive energy. Um, uh, but it's it's not always it's not always easy. Um, I've certainly had my own ups and downs, and to acknowledge when you're down is totally great and to make sure you call on the people in your life whether friends family loved ones or professionals to help
because it, it, you know, as I'll turn it around back to her old sick conversation a moment ago, you, you take care of yourself and that helps you take care of others. You know, the whole airplane metaphor, you know, put your mask on first, then put the, your, then put the next person's on. Um, so that's important because you need, you as a person, you as an individual, you need to come out of this okay. Because we do see the light at, at the end of the tunnel. So we know it's coming. So you don't want to, don't want to, don't fall off that edge. Take care of yourself. That'd be, that'd be the biggest thing. And if, it, and then building off our conversation earlier, if you can just do one thing, a, one thing a day, then just one is okay. You know, the secret to happiness, I sometimes joke is low expectations. <laughs> but, I, but I think that's more, that's more true now than ever. If you can just get one thing done a day, that's fine. If you get more, great. But you know, if you can manage through, just make sure you get that one thing done. Um, and uh, I, th I think that's good. And so th that I feel like is maybe the big takeaway for all of us. And as we talk about the idea of building back better and reviewing our own processes, you know, keeping some guardrails for yourself and figuring out what what you can do to be able to take care of yourself and not continue to sacrifice yourself for the benefit of others, for the benefit of the show. You know, you, you are valued, you are valued, you are valuable human. It's, it, it's almost sounds counterintuitive, but human assets, human capital, that's the most important thing. There's a great quote I love from the art of leadership. It's right in the beginning of the book. And basically the big takeaway is that people are more important than things. And we get wrapped up so much in this stuff and like, how much does that cost? How much does that cost? Is that going to work? Well, come back to the people because we've all done shows where there are no, there's no big set. It's the people. That's the connection. Go back to the beginning of our conversation, talking about live events. Someone's on stage doing something. Someone's watching, right? That's what it's about. I remember doing Les Mis and the gates didn't come on for the attack on the Rue Plume. And you're like, all right, guys, there's no set. Go act. And Marius came off and he was like, that was the best time ever. That was so good. <laughs> so just come, coming back to those basic values, those really, really simple things. It's about the people. It's about connecting. Right? That's the, the most important thing I want to take out of this is remembering, like, like, I love seeing you in two dimensions and being able to look at you. But to be able to, to, to like, don't take this the wrong way, being able to touch you, you know, being able to yeah. actually inhabit the same space is a totally different thing and remember the value of that yeah and, and all the changes we're, we've kind of talked about today are come back to that to valuing the people valuing the person and valuing yourself i think it's all that's all so important and so i mean i want it's it's the it's part of the theme i haven't crystallized it for the symposium this year is is really about that rededication reconsecration coming back you know I don't want I don't want to keep stealing Joe Biden's thunder, but it's really it's about building back better. We want to come mm -hmm. back, but we want to come back better than we were before. It's not about going back. We want to go forward. We want to take the lessons from this and do better. Better in our own processes for our work, better in our own processes for ourselves, better in our own processes for our society. It's it, and then we will have learned. You know, what's the worst thing when you make a mistake is not learning from it. Make the mistake. Mm -hmm. We've made lots of mistakes. I've made mistakes. Our culture, our society, everybody makes mistakes, but it's what you do. <laughs> about it. What are you going to do to go forward? How, 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 do you, how do you do that? Amazing. Amazing words, Matthew. Do you want to give the Broadway Symposium a bit of a plug in terms of dates, et cetera? Yeah, and how people sign yeah up? We're, we're, we're doubling the amount of dates this year. We're going from two to four. So it's May 21 through 24. So it's going wow. to go over Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday so that we have more time for more connections, more time to do more explorations. And also, so it serves the global audience better. So we can have times where it's not just midday in New York, but we can have some programming where it's midday, you know, in your, your Hong Kong time zone for you fabulous people in Perth. I love that people in Perth. I love Perth. I've been to Perth three times. Great. <laughs> and it's totally strange, but true. Um, you know, so we're, it's, it's really excited about going back online. It will be fully digital. So you'll be able to access everything either live online or through the replay. So yeah. for all these different time zones, don't have to feel like you're missing out on anything. If you do actually have to sleep or even better, if you actually have some work. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I'm really excited. We've got two great keynote speakers, uh, Lisa Don Cave, who's the production supervisor and original PSM for Frozen. 
Rocky, and a million other great shows. Um, she's going to talk about her work with Black Theatre United um, and a new project she's involved in, um, Broadway and Beyond, for uh, creating access for BIPOC stage managers. So that's really exciting. And Amanda Spooner is going to do a keynote who is the force behind the year of the stage manager, um, which uh, this whole last year has been celebrating the uh, to do it succinctly, the, the first official stage management contract with Actors' Equity. So it's um, the recognizing that as its own unique position um, and looking back over this crazy, who would have thought when year of the stage manager started, it was going to be this kind of a year. Yeah. So uh, they, they've taken the year and made it a year and a half because as Amanda says, we're stage managers, we deserve it. And it's been a heck of a year. So <laughs> she's going to reflect over that whole experience of creating You're the Stage Manager and uh, this great community that has been built on Facebook of over, like, I think it's 7,000 people on that Facebook group. Um, and uh, please uh, go to the website, broadwaysymposium.com. Uh, join us for the SM Tech Fridays. You could subscribe to the newsletter. Check us out the social media. We're always engaging on I Instagram, Facebook, Twitter really want to keep growing the community because we're, you know, we're thousands of people, uh, tens of thousands of people, this community of stage managers around the world. And we have so much more in common than we do separately. You know, our shared humanity, the way we, the, the knack we have for taking care of people and facilitating process and communicating and our empathy. It's, um, I, I'll just say it again, you know, stage managers are some of the best people. And being able to have a conference like the Broadway Stage Management Symposium that is just for us because, damn it, we deserve it, right? <laughs> it, you know, the, the one-off webinars are wonderful to connect us. But imagine doing stuff like this over the course of four days and being able to hang out in breakout rooms and workshops and being able to engage. You know, we're going to watch a show. We did that last year. We watched a show and had a chat with the stage managers from that show. So it was, it was so much fun. Um, so please check it out. I can, Anna knows I can go on and on about it forever, but yeah. <laughs> I'll wrap up. I'll put, the, I'll put the link in the chat again, broadwaysymposium.com. Um, check it out, reach out to me. Some people had asked about connecting with me on LinkedIn. Totally, please do. Please the more we connect, the better we all are. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Matthew. And well, I wanted to also make mention of one of the uh, sessions that we're doing next week, which I'm really looking forward to. It's on accessibility in theatre. Uh, we're talking with Melanie uh, Jupp from the Smith Centre in Las Vegas, who has done lots of fundraising to get accessible theatre at the Smith Centre, and a gang from Cahoots in Ireland who have brought a sensory friendly show to the Smith Centre um, from all the way from Ireland and tour with sensory friendly performances and I um, am really excited to chat to them because I did not know how difficult it was to get things, these things facilitated um, from a funding perspective, how things cost, um, what you need to set up, how you need to do it correctly and um, I think this is really uh, a, a good foundation of uh, starting to understand the scale and scope of uh, what is possible in the sensory friendly realm um, and how we can make theatre accessible for all. So I think that's a great learning opportunity. Um, Matthew just put the, did you put the link in? I've just put the uh, registration for the accessibility webinar. So please join us for that. And Matthew, thank you. I can't wait to get to New York and give you a hug in the future, in real, at some point, in a real symposium. But I will be satisfied with an online right. one this year. I can't wait to uh, see you and chat with everybody in May. And uh, thanks again for joining us on the We Make Events UK session, Fireside Chess session. Um, I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. It's great to see you too. I'll look forward to that to that moment when it comes. And uh, hope <laughs> to see you all at some point in the near future, in, in, in a rectangle somewhere or in person. Wonderful. Thanks, Matthew. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Signing off. Be well, everyone.